Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Historia Politica Publica. In the episode of today I will talk about Immanuel Kant, the philosopher from Konigsberg, one of the figures of the Enlightenment, and his approach to the French Revolution because it coincided in time in the era of his most prolific uh, writings and why he uh, supported the French Revolution in a spite that he made clear that uh, he created the right to rebellion. And this is because in part the French Revolution was a new step towards a new society to eliminate the all uh, reminiscence of absolutism and the ancient regime and there were many philosophers who support the French Revolution. It was something modern, something that uh, threatened to uh, create a new system more egalitarian for the people living in the societies and people like Hegel, Immanuel Kant and many other philosophers and writers were supporting the revolution. You have also Thomas Paine who had written Common Sense which became the symbol of the a American Revolution some years before. So a bit of context, Immanuel Kant lived in Konigsberg from 1724 to 1804. Konigsberg is the actual city of Kaliningrad in Russia but at that time it was part of Prussia and he barely lived his hometown and seldom changed his habit. It was very famous Immanuel Kant in his small town, so this kind of philosopher who used to offer a walk at the same hour every day. And it is said that he was super, so precise in the time that he went to his daily stroll that it has been said that his neighbors set their watches by him. Two events made him modify this routine nonetheless. One was when he dedicated to read Emile, the book written by Jean, Jean, Jacques Rousseau, one of the figures of the linemen and had a great influence on Kant. And the other thing was when he missed his regular stroll was during the French Revolution. After receiving the news of the fall of the Bastille, he postponed the hour of his afternoon walk. And we might assume the general surprise among the habitants in Konigsberg. Certainly, a world shaking event had just happened. But, as I mentioned, in spite of his great interest in the French Revolution, he rejected the right, right to rebellion. Because he advocated for revolution as a continuous improvement who had to be carried by the state following a gradual procedure. Nevertheless, his influence uh, of Rousseau is clear. Rousseau was considered as also the father of the French Revolution. There is a festival which is called the Festival of the Supreme. I think it was made in 1793 in Paris. And the, the father of this new secular religion was Jean, Jean Rousseau, the book Emily, about a person who is uh, enjoying the life in nature and so on. All these ideas of the Enlightenment, uh, the French Revolution coalesce in time. So the age of enlightenment was uh, the context in which Immanuel Kant was living and he was one of the most influential philosophers of that time. The enlightenment, uh, it was a, we can define it as a dynamic process which meant liberation from prejudice and superstition. And this phenomenon was defined by the confidence on humans' capacity and willingness to achieve moral progress through the use of reason, by co on contrast with the common idea that God must uh, guide humanity, the lightning was a, a kind of new approach to life in which the humans could be considered as independent enough with initiative to achieve their means. In fact, in 1784, Kant published an answer to the question, what is enlightenment, one of his most famous essays, and while he admitted that the enlightened age had yet to arrive, he assumed that they were living in an age of enlightenment. That meant that people were progressing towards a reasonable and moral society. However, they needed to use their own understanding. As he said, quote, laziness and cowardice are the reasons why such a large proportion of men, even when nature has long emancipated them from alien guidance, nevertheless gladly remain immature for life, end quote. He defined immaturity as a lack of resolution and courage to use one understanding without the guidance of another. Hence, for him, quote, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self in core immaturity, end quote. Clearly influenced by the philosophers of the Enlightenment, and especially Rousseau and Kant, uh, Maximilien Robespierre, who, which was one of the leaders of uh, the Jacobins during the French Revolution, mentioned, quote, the prodigious effort of courage and reason in which people break the fetters of despotism to make them the trophies of liberty, end quote. We see here how one of the main voices of the revolution goes following the ideals of Kant and Rousseau. Immanuel Kant uh, wrote what is alignment in 1784, where Rousseau wrote his 
uh, text 1750s, 1760s. So Kant is a bit uh, younger than Rousseau, but still they they share this intellectual paradigm, same with Voltaire and many other uh, writers from the second half of the 18th century. The French Revolution emerged in part as a consequence of the economic crisis suffered by the French monarchy after its gargantuan expenditure on the American War of Independence. Nevertheless, the importance of the Enlightenment ideas to unite the events in France must not be understated. In other words, we can we have to consider the material conditions of the society, but also the ideas that were fluxing within the continent. Eric Hosband, the historian, on which I have done many episodes about him, analyzed how the philosophers can be justly made responsible for the revolution. As they made the difference, quote, between a mere breakdown of an old regime and the effective and rapid substitution of a new one, end quote. So the philosophers create uh, ideas that could uh, help for the transition to the ancient regime, to the modern state. If the modern intellectual current had been relevant to start a process to eliminate absolutism and the feudal privilege, the expansion of education shall be essential to keep progressing until the dawn of the Lightened Age, as Kant told. To reach this milestone, Kant advised for a transition to be carried through gradual reforms within a considerable interval of time. In other words, the Lightened should be initiated from above by reform and not from below by revolution, according to Kant. So here there is the contradiction. Why did he support the French Revolution, which in theory, which are a movement carried by the masses, at least in the first instant, until the Jacobins and the Girondins, middle class bourgeoisie, uh, took the power and they start to uh, dismiss the role created by the sans culotte which was the working class of Paris and many other revolutionaries. It's important to go to the fall of the Bastille that happened the 14th of July of 1789. That year in 1789, Kant already was one of the most important German philosophers of the century and having followed through the French Revolution, many intellectuals were expecting his verdict about the events that were happening in Paris. But he did not talk uh, until four years later, and the philosophers and the people interested in the verdict of Kant had to wait until 1793, when Kant published an essay called On the Common Saying. This might be true in theory, but it does not hold in practice. His approach about the right to revolution did not vary substantially since 1784. He expressed that, quote, all revolt that leads into rebellion is the highest and most punishable offense in the Commonwealth because it destroyed the latter's very foundation, end quote. So Kant was very conservative in his approach, even though he advocated for a reform towards society. It is also said that because Kant was living under Prussia and the king was Frederick IV, he was still afraid that uh, this could take uh, consequences in his uh, life. And in fact, Kant uh, emphasized the role of Frederick IV as a kind of enlightenment uh, king. And this seems a contradiction with his approach to eliminate absolutism and to uh, establish a society in which there will be more equality. So you have uh, these kind of paradoxes between a people who have some ideas, but were living in some times in which expressing those ideas could have consequences on them. This happened to Hegel centuries, uh, sorry, uh, decades later, because he supported widely the French Revolution, but when the Restoration came in Europe and Bonaparte uh, was defeated, uh, he had to keep silent for the rest of their la his life and could not express too much his sympathy for the French Revolution. This happened even in the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, how the, the characters can be accused to have support Bonaparte after the restoration of the King Louis XVIII. So, after the execution, execution of Robespierre in 1794, the Thermidorian reaction started and the French Revolution faced a new epitome. One year later, Kant wrote Perpetual Peace, a philosophical sketch, and perhaps considering the recent death of one of the revolutionary leaders, he maintained his opposition to revolution and explicitly condemned those who follow this method to replace a ruling system. He said, quote, It remains wrong in the highest degree for the subjects to pursue their rights in this way, and they can in no way complain of injustice if they are defeated in this conflict and must subsequently suffer the harshest punishment for it. End quote. Two years later, in 1797, the Metaphysics of Morals was printed and Kant remarked and, uh, that the reform of the political constitution must be covered by the sovereign himself rather than through revolution by the people. So it seems that he then changed his approach through the years. 
In the context of faculties, written in 1798, however, Kant did not conceal his admiration and concern at the same time with the French Revolution. He said, quote, I maintain that this revolution has a roost in the hearts and desires of all spectators who are not themselves caught up in it, a sympathy which borders almost on enthusiasm, although the very utterance of this sympathy was fraught with danger. Considering his condemning approach to the right of revolution, this assertion might seem contradictory. Can comprehend the historical importance of the French Revolution, and perhaps his philosophical denial to overthrow a regime through rebellion did not impede him to enjoy this majestic millstone. His emotional language was transparent when he described the intensity which was being lived during this period. He remarked, quote, enthusiasm direct exclusively towards the ideal by the revolutionaries and that even the external public of onlookers sympathized with their exaltation. In fact, he was not the only philosopher startled by the French Revolution, as I mentioned earlier. A wide range of intellectual poets and philosophers from Britain, Switzerland, Italy and Germany were captivated by the events in France. According to Eric Hosborn, quote, the list of European talent and genius which support the French Revolution initially can only be compared with the similar and almost universal sympathy for the Spanish Republic in the 1930s, where you had many intellectuals like and writers like John Dos Passos, Ernest Hemingway, Martha Gellhorn, uh, Albert Camus, George Orwell, and hundred more who allied themselves with the Second Republic from 1931 and during the Spanish Civil War against Franco's army. One of the philosophers who was exaltated by the French Revolution and enjoyed that process was Hegel, who defined the French Revolution as, quote, a glorious mental dawn and as a world historical turning point. It seems hardly disputable that since 1789, modern society has been founded on the revolution universal principle of freedom, liberté, égalité, fraternité. In that sense, uh, Kant, who, as we have seen, had a kind of a contradictory approach in that sense, we can analyze some of the political theories implemented in France and how this had a great resonance in Kant's writing. His assertion that, quote, a person cannot become a domestic animal to be employed in any chosen capacity and retained during without consent for any desired period, end quote, had similarities with the abolition of feudalistic obligation implemented by the members of the Third Estate during the French Revolution. The modification of the charge, tithe, and venal offices signify a stratification to a modern and more mobile society, an essential proposition in Kant's philosophy. He was a firm critic of the hereditary rights of the sovereign descendants, advocating instead for the possibility to progress through talent, work, and good fortune. The articles of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen of 1789 portrayed also evident analogies with Kant's political theory. Some of the premises included that Quote, the law is the expression of the general will. This is the article 6. The article 11 says that free communications of thought and opinions are essential. And the separation of power in the article 16. And just to finish the article 4, another example says that the exercise of the natural rights of each man has no limits except those which ensure that all other members of society enjoy the same rights. In other words, you have freedom as long as this freedom does not curtail the freedom of others. Henceforth, the influence of the Enlightenment ideas in the French Revolution was undeniable, and from 1789 to 1792, the steady process of renovation did not alienate excessively with Kant's idea of gradual reformism. The legislature promoted a rational program to abolish the privilege of the monarchy as a switch from absolutism to parliamentarism. Louis XVI was to remain king with a more limited power, and some of the reforms meant that legislature provide for only a suspensive rather than a permanent veto. This, the new national court established a difference between executive, legislative, and judicial. This separation of powers formulated in the French constitution was a basic condition in Kantian philosophy, as he remarked that the sovereign of the people, which is the legislator, can also be the ruler. Henceforth, the ideas of the Enlightenment relate closely with the foundation of the French Republic, and this parallelism might help to explain the great interest shown by the philosopher through those years. In other words, people believe Nowadays, that the French Revolution was a chaotic uh, approach in which from the minute one people start to guillotinate their enemies and so on and cut uh, uh, the head of the bodies. However, the French Revolution until 1792 could be considered even a kind of conservative progress. Obviously, for that uh, time it was quite radical, but 
the first republic it was all only created in 1792 and the thing is like the people on the woman in paris went to uh, versailles in october uh, 1789 three months later after the fall of the bastille they took the king and the queen and they put in, them in paris to surveil them and in that way uh it was only that it could become a a parliamentary monarchy rather than an absolutist monarchy the problem of that is that the king did not accept that and he started to send letters to the whole of europe to his the other monarchs uh, and they organized an army to class the revolution and when this happened it when the revolutionaries start to get angry with the king they had to organize the army everything become more radicalized and after that after 1792 it is when the guillotine started but during the th first three years the, pr the process was quite uh, it was gradual but slow and the thing is like if the king had not uh, betrayed their own country probably the revolutionaries could have stopped at the uh, monarch parliamentary monarchy anyway we cannot say that but it is important to say that robespierre saint just and the others were not as radical as they have been portrayed uh, by the the common uh, books, the, the history books and so on. In fact, uh, it's funny because the in the guillotine it is estimated that 17,000 people died during the years of the guillotine. Um, many people died even after Robespierre was killed, uh, same as saint -Just. And in fact, during the Commune of Paris, uh, the repression killed much more people. The estimate... Uh, uh, things that between 30,000 and 40,000 people died and 40,000 more were in prison sent to New Caledonia, torture and so on. So the thing is like much more people were repressed during the Commune of Paris, Paris Commune, rather than in the French Revolution. However, the Paris Commune is not studied as, as the French Revolution. Why? Obviously, the, the reason is clear. The Paris Commune, it was a working class government made by the people uh, egalitarian, there were interesting measures to create a, a just society, but it was classed by force in just two months because that example of mutual aid and common solidarity could not uh, go further from Paris. Whether it's the French Revolution, it is a kind of uh, system that was made by the bourgeoisie and even nowadays it is denounced at the process of the last years, but it is explain us it, during the whole process all was just murdering people by no reasons and so on this is far from truth so i encourage all of you to study in deep the french revolution which is a fascinating period and just to finish with the uh, the episode and to finish with emmanuel kant i wanted to speak about uh, his uh, essay perpetual peace which it is one of his last works and one of the most interesting i find uh, because Keynes' argument uh, against a right of revolution is fundamental to understand his philosophical purpose to achieve the state of perpetual peace. The confrontation implied in a revolution or any type of conflict cannot set within his political theory. A return of the state of nature will be the consequence of a revolution, and this youngster of living in a lawless territorial unity is neglected by Kant. Here he differs totally with Jean-Jacques Gousseau, who explains that the state of, na of nature is the best kind of system for humanity rather than the state. Immanuel Kant, on the contrary, proclaimed the importance of abolishing the standing armies, as, quote, they constantly threaten other states with war by the very fact that they are always prepared for it, end quote. So he was a pacifist in that sense. Moreover, the expenditure of money in military rather than education is both immoral for humans and damaging for the economy. I agree totally with this view of Kant. A succession of endless war will therefore be an impediment to reach the enlightenment, as the state will lack the resources to cultivate the citizen's mind. There is no progress to be attained following the direction of violence, obviously. Eliminating the discovery of violence, his philosophy of continuous progress carried by the state as a reform from time to time may be attainable. Furthermore, the second half of the 18th century witnessed the Seven Years' War or the American of Independence, and presumably this period of turmoil influenced Kant's vision about the threat of conflict to reach the Enlightenment. Kant assumed that the path to knowledge must be founded in freedom and the principle of right, as humans are expected to be engaged in progressive improvement in relation to the moral end of its existence. One of his most optimistic approaches is his belief that a phenomenon of enlightenment can never be forgotten since it reveals in human nature an attitude and power for improvement. This idea resonates with the view exposed by Martin Luther King Jr. when he stated that, quote, the urge for freedom will eventually come, end quote, considering that oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever, as he said. 
Finally, the use of reason is paramount to create the universal freedom, which is the cornerstone of Kant's philosophy of right. Therefore, the aim shall be to create a worldless society based on education, as this paradigm will generate perpetual peace and enlightenment. As he emphasizes, quote, the task of establishing a universal and lasting peace is not just a part of the theory of right within the limits of pure reason, but its entire ultimate purpose, end quote. In other words, the anarchists had obviously had influence in this idea of a pacifist society based on education of individuals in order to reach a state of total freedom among all the sentient beings. And I finish here the episode of the French Revolution and how can approach that. I will do another of the revolution to explore more in depth the uh, kind of uh, event, but I think can living in that time have a good insight about what was happening there and how his philosophy with its many contradictions can help us to understand the current of the alignment in those years and his idea of perpetual peace I think is something interesting to try to extrapolate to our current world.